Greetings to you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to welcome each one of you for this Vespers meeting. We are delighted that you are here and may you receive a blessing from the Lord. Let us continue to worship Him, the true God, in spirit and in truth, this Sabbath day. We are happy that Pastor Ron Kelly is back with us. And his message today is entitled, True Men Wanted the Dividing Line. May we open our hearts to receive God's word. Let's pray. Our holy and gracious God, loving Father, thank you so much for all the blessings of life. Thank you, Lord, for every soul who has come to praise you, to worship you, and to listen to your word this evening. I want to place your man servant, Pastor Ron Kelly, in the presence of the Lord, I pray that you will touch him with your spirit, anoint him with power, that the words of his mouth might come clearly and distinctly, and it would be a blessing, Lord, to everyone who hears it. I pray as he is going to speak on true men wanted the dividing line, I pray that we would be the true people of God. I pray, Father, that we all would be blessed and encouraged by the word. And may your spirit be upon every hearer, that we might bear fruit thirty, sixty, and some hundredfold, to the glory of your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, We desire to open our hearts to you now. 
We desire, as your family, to have an encounter through your spirit with the living God. We desire, Lord, to be taught, and we hope to be touched. So now, Lord, I'm praying, anoint us all. May we all be aware that we are actors on the divine stage proclaiming the goodness of God. Now we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your bulletins out, we're going to say education page 57 together. We're in the midst of a series on true people, true men, true women, true children. It's the greatest need. Let us be focused on being available to meet the need. Education, page 57. Say it with me. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Amen. This morning I want to bring to your attention a man by the name of Charles Hayden Spurgeon. Virgin. He only lived to be 57 years of age. He had gout in one of his feet, battled poor health. His wife was so ill that she usually could not come to hear him preach. But with a little touch of godly humor, he said, I have gout in my right leg, so I stand on my left leg while I preach. People would come to hear him preach, and they would have to get to church an hour early to find a seat. His sermons were transcribed the next day and sold by the thousands. He became probably the first man with an international audience long before there was modern media. He was a man whose sincerity was almost palpable, perfect conviction and sincerity is how one person described him. He once was to preach in the Crystal Palace in London to a crowd of almost 24,000 people. He went into the palace one day to try to figure out where to place the pulpit for the best auditory dynamic. And as he was testing the acoustics, he cried out in a loud voice, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. What he didn't know was that in one of the galleries, a workman was working. And that message came unaware to him of anything else going on. And the man was smitten with conviction on account of his sin. As he put down his tools, he went home. And there, after a season of spiritual struggling, found peace and life by beholding the Lamb of God. Spurgeon told the stories year after, years after its happening on his deathbed. Spurgeon was personally acquainted with Hudson Taylor, China Inland Mission uh, originator. George Mueller. Spurgeon was a man that was moved by the Spirit of God. And his audience sat spellbound listening to him preach. When David Livingston died in 1873, a discolored and much-used copy of one of Spurgeon's printed sermons entitled, Accidents, Not Punishments. I'd like to read that sermon. It was found among Livingston's few possessions, along with this handwritten comment at the top of the first page, very good, D period, L period. He had carried it with him throughout all of his travels in Africa. Spurgeon was once speaking, and he quoted William Wilberforce. He was diametrically opposed to slavery. He said, I do from my inmost soul detest slavery, and although I commune at the Lord's table with men of all creeds, yet with a slaveholder I have no fellowship of any sort or any kind. Whenever a slaveholder is called upon me, I've considered it my duty to express my detestation of his wickedness And I would as soon think of receiving a murderer into my church as a man-stealer. 
And then this comment from Wilberforce or about Wilberforce. Not so very long ago, our nation tolerated slavery in its colonies. Philanthropists endeavored to destroy slavery. But when, it was, when was it utterly abolished? It was when Wilberforce roused the church of God and when the church of God addressed herself to the conflict, then she tore the evil thing to pieces. Spurgeon was reported to have said, I've been amused with what Wilberforce said the day after they passed the act of emancipation. He said merrily to a friend when it was all done, is there not something else we can abolish? That was said playfully, but it shows the spirit of the church of God. Spurgeon would go on to say, she lives in conflict and victory. Her mission is to destroy everything that is bad in the land. When Spurgeon died, it was estimated that 100,000 people either viewed him as he laid in state or attended his funeral. There were 65 uh, pair of horse-drawn carriages that were in the conveyance of the mourners and the delegates. The procession was estimated to be nearly two miles in length. There were four services. The last was for the Stockwell Orphanage, which was one of the orphanages that was supported by Spurgeon and his work. Now I'm going to read a couple quotes, and then we're going to jump in to our message. The first quote, the house is being robbed. He's speaking about the church. Its very walls are being digged down, but the good people who are in bed are too fond of the warmth and too much afraid of getting broken heads to go downstairs and meet the burglars. They're even half vexed that a certain noisy fellow, speaking of the burglars, will spring his rattle or cry thieves. And one more. To the extent which sheer frivolity and other insane amusements have been carried into connection with some places of worship would almost exceed belief. You have to remember, this is the late 19th century. There can be no doubt that all sorts of entertainments, as nearly as possible approximating to stage plays, have been carried on in the connection with the places of worship and are at this present time in high favor. Can these things promote holiness or help in communion with God? Can men come away from such things and plead with God for the salvation of sinners and the sanctification of believers? We loathe to touch the unhallowed subject. It seems so far removed from the walk of faith and the way of heavenly fellowship. In some cases, the follies complained of are even beneath the dignity of manhood and fitter for the region of the imbecile and for the thoughtful man. Spurgeon. Yes, I've entitled this message, The Dividing Line. You know, there's a, uh, a large skyscraper in San Francisco that's leaning. 58 stories tall, 650 feet. It's a place where if you're really rich, you can spend millions and get a condo. The problem is when they built the skyscraper, they didn't go all the way down to bedrock. Codes didn't require it. If you can imagine this amazing edifice that is leaning to the northwest, it has sunk farther in the first six years of its existence than it was intended to, sh to sink down into the soil in the whole expected life, uh, life expectancy of the building. It is now leaning 26 inches to the north and to the west. The people who live in the building noticed water coming in through the parking garage and they were alarmed. It turns out that several in the Homeowners Association are suing. Of course, uh, you have the builders and the designers who say that it's perfectly safe and nothing's wrong, but I suspect if you live somewhere up towards the top and you think about those 26 inches, which might be more than 26, I thought I heard 29 in one report, but the idea of something that big and that heavy in a seismic zone makes it a little hard to go to sleep at night. And just like in modern-day Christianity, everybody's got to figure out who they're going to listen to. Are the builders and the designers right that there's nothing to be worried about? They say it's the subway work going on next door that's causing it to sink and lean. 
The city says, no, it was sinking and leaning before we ever started. They've hired an engineer to put in 50-some pylons to go all the way down to bedrock, 250 feet beneath the building, but they've had to change their plan and decide to only go with 18 because the more they work on the problem, the worse it gets. Imagine living in this building. And what I thought was so particularly wonderful about the building was its name. For perhaps there's more than the leaning tower of Pisa. Uh, perhaps we're seeing a whole society tilt for the name of this building is the millennium. And I want you to be thinking about where society is moving at this very moment. Now, when you go to thinking about a message that's based on the middle of five concepts that describe the kind of people the world needs, not bought, not sold, not flattered, bribed, or terrified, that's the first one. In their inmost person, true and honest, that's the second one. But when you get to the third one, they don't fear to call sin by its right name. You're dealing with a very weighty subject. And I'd like to suggest that it is the zenith and the most preeminent of all of the dynamics of needed essentials for our families and our churches and our society. For indeed, the first two prepare you to announce with prophetic voice right from wrong, and the last two are what you should expect and what is needed in the wake of announcing right from wrong. Because you must be true to duty as the needle to the pole once you've announced. And you must be prepared for the heavens to fall because that's sometimes what happens when you confront a sinful society or an evil man or woman. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. And I want to distinguish something from the beginning of this message, and that is this. This is not a message to empower those individuals with a twisted experience in Christ or a twisted religious experience that's not in Christ that makes them negative and critical. That is a beast of a completely different color. What we're talking about today are people like Moses who love God's people, like most moms and dads who love their children, and like many in the church of God who are a fountain of hope and beauty and loving Christian affection, but are not afraid to articulate what is deadly and dangerous in our societal arrangements, in our social interactions. Yes, this is not a sermon to legitimate that negative, shriveled up, prune-like Christian experience that can't find peace for themselves and finds a little bit of comfort in announcing somebody else's problems. If you've got a negativity or critical spirit problem going on, someone on this staff would be glad to visit with you, but you must certainly understand the love of God that makes your experience in Christ one of new hope and new joy and new beginnings day by day. But in the family of the most faithful and in the experience of the faithful, there come times when true north is no longer the compass setting of the collective whole. And there are moments when moms or dads or moms with dads or dads with moms or parents with children or preachers with congregations or elders amongst themselves or pastors to pastors, there's a call. And the call is based on truth and it becomes a dividing line. I want you to remind, remind you what Jesus said in the book of Matthew when he declared, do not think that I came to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. Matthew 10, 34, and to set at variance different members of the family. This morning, I'm here to assure you that if no one has the courage to call out right from wrong, the society will lean the wrong way. And all the attempts to fix it afterwards will render it a greater problem. So let us lay a foundation for a healthful present and a healthful future by turning to God's Word. Exodus chapter 32, the story of the golden calf. It says in verse 1, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron, and they said to him, Come, make us a god who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know. What has become of them? Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Now, he didn't think they'd do it. They'd been poor. They'd been rich. As one athlete said, I've been poor and I've been rich, and rich is better. 
And he didn't think they'd take those earrings out of their ears, just like Pilate didn't think they'd want Jesus crucified after he had flogged him. But he made a fatal mistake. He didn't act from principle. And once you start acting on pragmatism, what you think will work, instead of working from the principles of divine administration, you're on a slippery slope. They popped those earrings out of their ears. They brought them to Aaron, and Aaron became the chief instigator, or at least the chief administrator, of one of the worst of all of the apostate experiences of the nation of Israel. You need to remember they had only, Moses is up on the mountain. They can still see the cloud. The lightning still flashes. The thunder still rolls. Not too long before, they'd said, all that you have said we will do. Verse 3, then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took this from their hand and he fashioned it with a graving tool and he made it into a molten calf and they said this is your God O Israel who brought you up from the land of Egypt now if that wasn't bad enough we have what is thoroughly the responsibility of Aaron in verse 5 now Aaron when he saw this he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord so it's one thing to feel under pressure in the absence of your younger brother, who's the, the real pillar, it appears, of Christian integrity and courage. It's another thing after you can see how your first acts have pleased the people to build an altar for worship and declare a religious feast the next day. But that's exactly what he did. And in the midst of that experience, we find a degradation of person that could have made the Egyptians blush. Idolatry and pagan worship were always linked up with licentiousness, evil sexual actions. And it's not long before we find the people of Israel without proper clothing on their body and proper action protecting holy relationship. It is as evil and as dark as the glory and the holiness of a few days before as they were at the base of the mountain proclaiming, you're our God, we have a covenant with you, we'll do what you say. This is the experience there at the base of Mount Sinai. You need to know there were some, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, that says ventured to denounce the proposed image, making it or calling it out as idolatry. She states they were roughly set upon, and in the confusion and excitement they finally lost their lives. I don't know if Aaron watched that happen or if his weakness only facilitated and fertilized its happening. But it did go on, and people who stood up paid the ultimate price. This experience is such that all of those that watched from the surrounding nations must have wondered what was going on. Verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They've made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them and I will make of you a great nation. The next part of the story is one that we won't spend much time on today, but what an opportunity for God to allow the Christ-like character of the Godhood to be developed in Moses as he mediates and pleads for his people. And in effect, Moses says, I can't bear to watch you destroy them. Destroy me if this is what must be done. Moses turns from the mountainside with Joshua. He finds Joshua on his way down. And as they come down the mountainside, there are two opinions of what's going on. Verse 17, now when Joshua heard the sound of the people, as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned. And he threw the tablets from his hand and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made, and he burned it with fire and ground it into powder, scouted it over the surface of the water, and made the sons of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you've brought such a great sin upon them? 
Aaron said, don't let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, make us a God. For who will go be before us for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt? We don't know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, and Moses stood in the gate of the camp, and he said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And the sons of Levi gathered. It's not a very pretty thing that happens next. If the commentary on patriarchs and prophets is correct, on the right side of Moses were the Levites who did not participate in the debauchery, and on the left were those who had participated but were repentant. There was a group, mainly of the mixed multitude, who resisted in high-handed rebellion, and God, as the theocratic judge of the nation, understood that they had come to the end of their ability to be reached, and he declared that should they persist in rebellion, they should be executed, and they were. 3,000 graves will mark the desert countryside. These kinds of moments are preventable. How often in our day is the love of pleasure disguised by a form of godliness, she'll write in Patriarchs and Prophets. A religion that permits men while observing the rites of worship to devote themselves to selfish or sensual gratification is as pleasing to the multitudes now as in the days of Israel. I want us for a moment to think about that because most of us can't imagine going as far as the pagan rites and cultish dynamics were replicated beneath the mountain of Sinai. But when we put the word selfish in there or sensual, we might have to stop and ask ourselves, is there a cross that actually brings itself into our lives and into our worship services? Or are our worship services to be just one step removed from the same kind of gatherings by those who make no allegiance to Christ? There are still pliant errands, she writes, who while holding positions of authority in the church will yield to the desires of the unconsecrated and thus encourage them in sin. Oh, pliant errands who hold positions of authority in the church. Built into that statement is a suggestion, no, an absolute conviction that positions of authority, which I took up the subject about three weeks ago, are stewards of the protection of an experience for the masses. But if you hold a position of authority and you give way to the unholy desires and the un unconsecrated wishes of the masses, the Bible says you're like a polluted spring. And I'll repeat the story just one more time because I kind of like to tell it how on that hot Sabbath afternoon we made our way around the lake at Camp Timber Ridge and there was the spring coming out of the water and one of the people in our group scooped up a little bit of water but in the midst of it they must have got a little bit of a leaf or something else like that. They felt that in their mouth and they spit. The only problem was they spit right on the well and all the rest of us that were hot and thirsty were anxious to get a drink now, weren't we? I want you to think about it. You give way before the wicked person, you're like a polluted spring or a walked on well. That's what Aaron did. And Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 20 tells us if Moses had not pled specifically for his brother, he would have died as the most responsible person. Responsibility is a weighty trust. Leadership is an important appointment for the protection against the lowest common denominator of the unconsecrated masses. The pliant errands are still around, she writes, who while holding positions of authority in the church will yield. The not so carefully hidden implication is that leadership requires people to stand, to not get out of the way. 
It in, it, it's built completely on the honesty of person in the inmost soul and certainly requires a person who can't be bought or sold. What a serious moment. Could we bring it into the 21st century? Let me do it for you personally. You get married and you're in love. But before the first 40 days are up, your spouse is involved in, in the most debauched, adulterous affair you could think of. That's what just happened to the people of God. I make a covenant. I deliver you. Fire by day, cloud fire by night, cloud by day. I take you out of the hands of the oppressive Egyptians. I, I bring you into this place to make this covenant. And we just, as it were, completed the covenant. And now you're bowing down, half clothed or unclothed, in the presence of a golden calf. And you're proclaiming him your great liberator. As a result, 3,000 people will die. And God will allow a plague to break out. And God will move the sanctuary out from the midst of his people. This isn't just one little old speed bump any more than an affair in a marriage is like a, a cut. And I deal with Unfortunately, it appears more often than not to be men. I don't know why it would so often be men who, after stabbing a spouse in the heart with unfaithfulness, think that one trip to see the pastor and everybody says they're sorry and it's all good. Last I checked, open heart surgery has a quite a long healing process. Last I checked, multiple stitches on and beneath the surface require a long-term care plan. God was not in the position of simply letting Israel think this was just one little speed bump. No, the, the consummated covenant and then the absolute abandonment of faithfulness to Christ sets up a situation that is deadly to the eternal well-being as well as to the marital well-being of the nation of Israel. How do you feel the day after? How do you feel when you walk out and you see the mounds of earth? How do you feel when there's sickness in the camp? And how do you feel when you look for the sanctuary and the pillar of cloud resting above it and you have to look to the outskirts? God is no longer in our midst. It's not a complete abandonment, but it is a statement. And for all of those women, especially today, and sometimes it's men, but more often it's not, for all of those women, let there be an elemental lesson in how to maintain respect and the proper parameters of equality in a relationship. God didn't just divorce his people, but he did move out of the house for a little while. And before a woman who puts up with the wrong kind of manhood, which is not manhood at all, says, I'm heading to the lawyer to get a divorce statement, she ought to make some in-between statements like, I'm moving out of the bedroom, I'm moving out of the house, and eventually I'll have to move out of this marriage. I will. It's not what I want. Respect is at the center of all meaningful relationships. And God, understanding this, determines to communicate this was not some minor offense to the relationship. It was sufficiently broken enough with biblical grounds for a divorce that God says, I'm moving out for a little bit. And through the mediation of Moses, there is a reconciliation, even though there is a wounded heart, which is God's. In deep sadness, the author of Patriarchs and Prophets writes, the people had buried their dead. 3,000 had fallen by the sword. A plague had soon broken out in the encampment, and now the message came to them that their divine presence would no longer accompany them in their journeys. The tent was pitched without the encampment, but Moses called it the tabernacle of the congregation, and in that little phrase they took hope. God had not rejected them. Unafraid to call sin by its right name, how long has it been, parents, since you've sat down with your adolescents and had a discussion about how to protect a future marriage with the power of self-respect and purity? How long has it been since you've said to your adolescent with whom uh, you put that piece of silicon 
in their hands, silicone in their hands, and their bill is being paid by you. How long has it been since you said, hey, let's look and see what you've been doing on your phone? How long has it been since you actually had the kind of conversations that throw down a little more than a speed bump to self-destructive behavior? When they come home late at night, you just don't want to ruin the relationship, so you're not going to talk about it. When they run over the, uh, when they run over the, the predetermined guidelines of when they're supposed to be home, are you so worried about what you've got to get out of this that you are going to turn into a pliant Aaron who becomes complicit in their self-destruction? Or are you able, through the power of the living Christ, through the love of proper relationship defined by the law of God and the living Christ in your heart, to say, wait a second, something is wrong, and it's not okay. There is a dividing line. It's called truth. And some people have learned to resist the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's going to look a little bit like it has before, before we get to the end. Now I want to return to Spurgeon. Especially if you're a preacher or an administrator listening to this message, I want you to think very seriously about what I'm about to share. I have this morning, I have two out of three books this one's called Evening by Evening. It's a devotional. I mean, this is included in modern-day software packages like Logos and others. These are devotions written by Spurgeon 150 years ago, and people are still reading them. Here's one called Spurgeon Gold, Pure and Refined, compiled by his great-great-great-grandson. I have a whole quote book it's nothing but quotes from Spurgeon on a, a, a bazillion things. Why, 150 years later, do people like me and people like you bother to want to know what a preacher in downtown England was preaching about? It's because, as one of his biographers said, his sincerity and his simplicity were evident. But what I want everybody to know as we come to the end of a leaning millennial age is I want everybody to understand that nobody in this life gets out of it without having to make a decision and draw some lines. Spurgeon was a man who believed that the gospel was the gospel, that it arraigned the sinner before the bar of justice and delivered them the glorious good news of God's sovereignty over the universe and even over Satan and even over death and sin. So as I read in the beginning of this message where he was greatly bothered by some of these modern pernicious evils that were coming into the church, he spoke up. He was the prince of preachers. And in his speaking up, he was about to become the schismatic of the Baptist Union. Yes, Spurgeon was not willing to watch modernity ravage the church. And in Spurgeon's day, modernity was an emphasis on scholasticism and the deconstructing of the inspired Word of God. So that now we could pick and choose out of the Scriptures and we could dissect and take apart the Holy Word of God. Spurgeon spoke up. He had a newsletter called The Sword and the Trowel. Great name. One of his friends wrote an article and then wrote another, and it began to stir up controversy. When we look at Spurgeon's life, as he comes towards the end, he has some very interesting things he says. He says, during the past month, many have put us to the anxious question, what shall we do? In other words, Spurgeon is confronting the strain of the Baptist Union of Great Britain. And he is suggesting that there needs to be some doctrinal accountability. The Word of God is the Word of God or it's not. The sovereignty of God is sovereign or it's not. So during the past month, many have put us the anxious question, what shall we do? To these, we have had no answer to give except that each one must act for himself after seeking direction from the Lord. In our own case, we intimated our course of action in last month's paper. We retire at once and distinctly from the Baptist Union. Nobody thought he'd do it. 
He leads his church out of union with the leaning Baptist church. This creates quite a problem. Spurgeon is a man of great influence. There are dialogues behind the scenes with the Baptist Union Committee. And lest anybody here become discouraged, I need to let you know that people are people. And so not only did Spurgeon have these discussions behind the scenes, and a variety of people called him out when he finally went public saying he didn't follow Matthew 18. He announces that indeed he did, but the people with whom he stated as much, who were actually sympathetic to his cause, ended up turning on him and lying about the fact that these discussions had been had. So Spurgeon looks like the great schismatic, the great divider of the Baptist convention. And by the way, Spurgeon, whose sermons were sold for money, and Spurgeon, who was able to raise a lot of money, much of it which went for amazing causes, when he spoke out against slavery, lost a wonderful connection with the Southern Baptist Convention in the United States who was built on slavery. No regrets. But here is Spurgeon who's dealing with men who not only can be bought and sold or not true and honest in their inmost person, and he's trying to maintain the dignity of Christ. And finally, on January 18, 1888, Spurgeon, who has now withdrawn from the Union of Baptists in Great Britain, is still not beyond the reach of their disdain, and they seek to censure him. There were 100 people there, almost. Only five would stand up in support of this great man. And not too long later, there was a convention similar to our general conference in which there were just about 2,000 people present. Let me read this. Spurgeon appealed for clarity above all. And I want people to really hear what I'm saying here because it appears that talking out of both sides of your mouth is a human problem. He sent a letter to the editor of the Baptist that said in part, and here I quote, whatever the council does, let it above all avoid the use of language which could legitimately have two meanings contrary to each other. Let us be plain and outspoken. There are grave differences. Let them be avowed honestly. One person by the name of Oakley, Henry Oakley, who was present before the equivalent of their general conference when Spurgeon's name came up, describes what it was like to be in the auditorium that day. He uses the word bedlam. I was present at the city temple when the motion was moved, seconded and carried. Possibly the city temple was as full as it could be. It would hold 5,000 seated, 1,000 standing. I was there very early but found only a standing seat in the aisle of the back gallery. I listened to the speeches. The only one of which I have any distinct remembrance was that of Mr. Charles Williams. He quoted Tennyson in favor of a liberal theology and justification of doubt, which is criticism of the Bible in this context. It's the dismantling of the inspired Word of God. So there's 2,000 people present at least, although it held 5,000, 2,000 plus could vote. The moment of voting came. Only those in the arena were qualified to vote as members of the assembly. And when the motion of censure was put, a forest of hands went up. And when they called against... The chairman, Dr. Clifford, did not see any hands, but history records there were seven. Make sure you understand what's going on. 2,000 plus delegates, a forest of hands go up to censure this man, 
who was unafraid to call sin by its right name, and only seven, none of which can be seen from the chairperson's position, stand in opposition. I'd like to have known those seven men. Without any announcement of numbers, the vast assembly broke into tumultuous cheering. I mean, you want to add injury to insult? And cheering and cheering, yet from some of the older men, their pent-up hostility found vent, and from many of the younger men, wild resistance of any obscurantist trammels. Okay, that's old English. And they said, broke loose. It was a strange scene. I viewed it almost with tears. I stood near a Spurgeon's College man. It was called the Pastor's College until after Spurgeon died, they changed the name of it. But I stood near, he was standing near somebody who graduated from Spurgeon's own training, whom I knew very well. Mr. Spurgeon had welcomed him from a very lowly position. He went almost wild with delight at this censure of the great and generous master. I say it was a strange scene that that vast assembly should be so outrageously delighted at the combination of the greatest, noblest, and grandest leader of their faith. I've talked about this with you through the last several weeks. If all you knew was the Spirit in the auditorium, you might know something. Spurgeon hated schism. This is John MacArthur writing. He did not want to be divisive, but his conscience would not permit him to align with the enemies of the gospel. And in the end, he concluded that separating from the union was actually the best way to promote true unity. Nothing has ever more largely promoted the union of the true than the break with the false. Now, I'm thankful that in our fellowship, we actually have a process for codifying our belief. And while we don't have a creed, we do have so many godly men and women who have given themselves to the prayerful discussion, dialogue, and study of the Word. But I'm here to assure you today that while most preachers have no sense of what Spurgeon's sincerity and simple commitment to the gospel would cost him. I could have used these illustrations for though, even though the heavens fall. But we're still talking about Spurgeon today. We're still reading Spurgeon's books today. And of all of those 2,000 plus people who found a fiendish delight in censuring someone who had already withdrawn himself, from that faith communion? It wouldn't take a PhD to figure out something's really wrong here. So before we close out this message today, I think it's important for you to understand that Jesus was too much the friend of his disciples to be quiet while they were practicing soul-destroying, sinful, diseased actions. And if there's one thing that a person can't have and succeed in life, both here and in the future, is a cowardice self-focus that saves them when they have a shepherding or a fiduciary, a responsible role to somebody else, and they sit in silence when they should speak up. And if there's anybody listening to me here today who thinks that speaking up doesn't have a price tag, you need to think again. That's why you have to be prepared to stand for the right, though the heavens fall. It gets worse before it gets better. Spurgeon only lived to be 57 years old. And of those 100,000 plus people that attended his viewings and his funerals, well, in his last months of life, he loved to go to the south of France. In his last months of life, he received, now listen, this is not an email era. He received 10,000 letters 
in a period of about six months, 10,000 letters of well-wishing as he was trying to convalesce. But he died a fairly young man. He followed Jesus who walked to a cross for this very same reason. And if you think there's no walk to the cross for you, you need to think again. But Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. There is a peace that passes understanding for those who love enough to say the kind and truthful truth. And this morning, I'm appealing to every parent, every spouse, every pastor, every administrator, every person within earshot of what I'm saying. The gospel creates a line. And it doesn't how many speak up, it doesn't matter how many speak up against it. The masses will be in the ascendancy in the days to come. We've had a brief respite, it appears. What are we going to do? Who are we going to be? This morning I'm appealing to you in the name of Jesus who died announcing that there was a problem with humanity and he would solve it with his blood. Who put his arms out on a cross and his hands were pierced. But his real criminal offense was being unafraid to call sin by its right name. It's still the greatest want of the world. And let me end as I begin. The heart of Moses, which would rather die than leave his people, is the heart that should be cultivated at the foot of the cross in the daily communion with Christ. so that it can be the truth as it is in Jesus. Because the truth without Jesus isn't really truth. May God help us. Indeed, we're standing on a firm foundation, the love of God, the provision of God, the presence of God. There is a divining line. There is a cross. If you thought you could get through Christianity without carrying it, I need to remind you today, it'll become the most endearing thing once you embrace it. May we walk with Jesus and pay the price. The world's in deep, deep trouble because most people kind of put their, see which way the wind is blowing and duck and cover. May God help us.
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the message that we heard this evening. We thank you, Lord, for Pastor Ron Kelly for his ministry. Thank you for the word that came, true men wanted the dividing line. I pray that we would be the true people of God that you're looking for. You do not need us, but you want us, because your love for us is so deep. I pray that we would be the true people of God, standing for the right, according to your word. Help us, Lord, to be committed and dedicated to your word and to your cause. Continue to bless each one of us, especially bless Pastor Kelly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.